This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. Today, we're talking about animals with powerful stories, the sort of stories that promote change in people's thinking and behavior about the environment. Later in the hour, we'll talk with experts from the Center for Biological Diversity and the National Wildlife Federation about such narratives and their animal stars. We'll take your calls and emails about creatures whose stories prompted social change too. So if you've got a question or comment, join our conversation. Give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 314-382-TALK. You can also send us an email at talk at stlpr.org. But let's start with a party. This past Saturday, a local celebrity with national profile welcomed her 40th birthday. She's none other than Peanut the Turtle, so named for her unusual figure, and whose figure comes from her shell growing around a discarded plastic six-pack ring that got stuck around her body when she was a much younger red-eared slider. We came here specifically because we saw that it was Peanut's 40th birthday. And we love Peanut, so we are so excited to see her. One, my daughter loves turtles, so she's fascinated about Peanut, shape, size, everything like that. And I think it's important to show her the effects of what littering can have when it comes to wildlife and the effects on how, you know, what we can do for conservation. That is a turtle. What do you think about Peanut's story? He had trash on his back, that's what I know. He was shaped like a peanut. <laughs> it was sad for him. Luckily, some people found him. It was just really sad. I was kind of surprised that she survived through all that with her condition, especially with how squished her middle part is. How has hearing Peanut's story maybe changed your view? Or, you know, you mentioned your son. Like, how impactful do you think Peanut's story will be for him? Uh, I think it would be pretty impactful not uh, he you know as a young kid they kind of just tend to throw things wherever they wherever they want them to land and I feel like it'll help him understand like the importance of picking up trash not because just because mom says to but because it will help our community and our environment. What did you learn today? Uh, Be kind to turtles. Make sure we don't put straws in trash right? Yeah because they'll get stuck in the turtles noses. I learned that Peanut's an 80s baby, like your mom, because we're awesome. And then we learned how we need to recycle. we got to cut those rings up, and some of the companies need to do better and make biodegradable things. Honestly, being here today just reinforced a lot of what I've already been doing, but it also gave me more hope in terms of more people will have that same like wildlife-conscious view of what they have and how they need to either recycle or contain or anything like that since it can have negative impacts of littering. And what gives you hope? Would you share some of that? Because I feel like it's it's in short supply sometimes lately. The kids. I mean, I think you were in the classroom too. You saw that it was probably half children and each one looks like they had a, a unique understanding in terms of what they saw with Peanut and how they could help in terms of not producing that to happen again. That was Nick Eschbacher, Jen and Logan Hankhouse, Aaron and Holly Wallace, Dejanay Shahan, Michael Cannell, and Layla Karimi. They were among the many folks who were at Powder Valley Conservation Nature Center in Kirkwood this past Saturday for Peanut the Turtle's 40th birthday. And now with us to talk a little more about Peanut's story is her caretaker, Matthew Cavanaugh, who is a naturalist with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Matthew, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So let's go back to when you first heard about Peanut. Do you recall that first time that you heard about this animal and her unique shell shape? Yeah, so... Personally, when I first heard about Peanut, it probably started when I was doing my internship out at Powder Valley. So that was 2021. Um, and it was when I first saw her, I was kind of shocked. You know, mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, that's kind of odd. But I um, quickly learned, uh, learned to really like Peanut, appreciate her, and learned more about her story as time went on. Mm-hmm. And did it surprise you at all, Matthew, that a plastic ring could have that effect on an animal's development? 
I, I think it definitely was surprising, especially seeing how everything works on the inside, you know, after doing that research and finding out what happened to her. Um, but I think what's really surprising is the impact that it's actually had on the people around her. Mm -hmm. And you said on the inside. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so Fido's kind of got a long story along with some medical issues. Um, for a long time, it really, really, really thought Peanut was a boy. Um, and that was until about 2020. Um, during that period of time, we noticed Peanut stopped eating a lot mm -hmm. of her food. And we we're like, hey, what's going on? That's not, that's not quite right. So um, during that entire time, they took some blood samples and they were trying to figure out what was happening. And they found some weird results. They said, all right, let's pull her in and do an x-ray. So when we pulled that x-ray, we actually ended up seeing that there's a huge mass on the back of her shell, and no one really knew what it was at the time. We were really concerned that it could have been really anything. I mean, people's minds were running rampant, and people were kind of preparing for the worst at that point. Mm -hmm. And then um, they ended up taking her to the zoo vets, um, and the zoo took care of her right away. They, they made a small incision, and they tried to figure out what it was. Turns out, this boy turtle that we knew all along was a girl. They were egg follicles all stuck up in there. Right, right. She couldn't let them pass because of that shell shape, and she was having some other issues inside. So they went ahead, they took out those egg follicles, um, and they also ended up uh, removing her ovaries at the same time. No more of that issue. Mm -hmm. No more. And we had uh, one of your colleagues here to talk about Tiger Lily, the, the two-headed snake, who also went through the same procedure, right? Yeah, Tiger Lily went through a very similar procedure. Um, it just so happens that everything happens at Powder Valley. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, but everything went well. Um, so same procedure as Tiger Lily. Right. Did. Now, Peanut the Turtle was just nine years old when she was discovered in 1993. She's now turning 40. Matthew, is it unprecedented for uh, a turtle of her species, she's a, a red-eared slider, for an animal like this to live to at least 40, especially considering the, the unique shape of her shell? Yeah, I will say turtles, uh, especially red-eared sliders, um, on average, you know, live about 30 years in the wild is what I found for red ears. Uh, but just getting theirs, you know, it's a big challenge. Uh, from what I could find is adulthood survival rates of most turtles and stuff being about 1,000 to 1. So mm -hmm. just getting to adulthood, getting to that maturity level of 9, it's already a battle. Right. So just so people understand that she was named Peanut because her her shell, uh, it almost, it looks like two turtles stuck together. Like if you were to just look at the, the carapace part of it. So it, it the name really does have to do with what her shape is like. And those egg follicles that you were talking about, how many of them were there? And they were trapped right in that midsection? Yeah, so I don't know exactly how many of those egg follicles are actually in there. Um, mm -hmm. When they pulled them out, they actually they found that for Peanut, it ended up being 10% of her body weight. So Peanut's already like a nine-pound turtle. Mm -hmm. um, so she was probably around 10 pounds when that all happened. Right. And were there other challenges that were associated with Peanut's shape? Yeah, there, there definitely was some. I can probably guess during, if we go all the way back to when she was found in 93, I, I bet her life before that, kind of swimming around in the creek, was probably a pretty tough life, especially mm -hmm. with that ring on there. Um, and then after that, we kind of ran into some issues, mostly with um, kind of some shell issues, uh, some scoots not coming off. Because mm -hmm. uh, if you can imagine, you know, it's like a figure eight shape almost exactly now. But uh, turtles have these scoots, which are almost like, it's a fingernail-like uh, material that grows on their shell, and that's what the shell's made out. And they got to get rid of it every so once in a while. Like, we have to get rid of the dead nail on the end of our finger. Mm -hmm. So um, she had a lot of issues getting those scoots off from that pinch point right in the middle there. And we right. actually had to take her to the vet quite often to get those taken care of. Mm -hmm. Now, Peanut has lived at the Powder Valley Conservation Nature Center in Kirkwood since she was discovered back in 93. And... The person who found her was was a hunter. Yeah. So when she was found, it was like it was the no November of 90, 1993. So uh, when she was found, it was a hunter that found her roaming around the creek, um, and he ended up taking her out to the St. Louis Zoo because that's the first place you're gonna take an animal like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they ended up taking all that stuff off for us. So the the six ring they cut that off and they. They decided that they couldn't take Peanut in, so they immediately called the conservation department. Um, 
and that was still in 93. So then she moved actually out to August A. Bush Conservation Area, Mm -hmm. so um, out that way. And then it was, she spent quite a few years out there, um, from 93 until 2012 is when she lived out there. Okay. And then 2012 is when she moved to Powder Valley. Right. But she had a job. So (laughs) was it because... Peanut could not be rela- released back into the wild that she stayed at Powder Valley Conservation Nature Center at Bush and then also you know, was going to many different places across the state. Uh, it was partly because she was an ideal ambassador. Is that what was happening? Yeah, Peanut's job um, is what we call an ambassador animal. And those animals are really key tools uh, for conservation education Mm -hmm. and providing, you know, the thought process of what happens if something like that happens or what is wildlife. So Peanut's story is obviously what if. um, And it's a really big story. So she was kept for that reason. And she did spend a long time doing that education portion. So for about 30 years she was on the job, and she just recently retired from Mm -hmm. her professional life. Right. And in the last year or so, Matthew, you've been Peanut's caretaker. In that time, what has been the range of reactions visitors have to meeting Peanut? Yeah, so for a lot of first-time visitors, it's all of a sudden it goes, oh, look, there's a turtle tank. And they get up close to the turtle, and they see there's pictures all over it, and they're kind of wondering what's going on there. And they take one look, and they're like, oh, my goodness, what happened to that turtle? And then they get to read the story because we have the full story next to her tank, so mm-hmm. we're not having to constantly stand there. But, you know, <laughs> but um, you know, I think the biggest reaction is people come back to the counter, and they say, Peanut's crazy like that's a crazy story yeah yeah um and it it definitely makes people think um, Mm -hmm. for sure so one of the people we heard in that bit of audio from peanut's birthday party was saying that you know peanut is an 80s baby like that parent do you also find that there are many parents or people who are a little bit older who remember some of the news that came out about this animal yeah definitely a lot of people that heard about the news i actually ran into two people at that event um, that were so stoked to be there because they knew Peanut from the past. Uh, Mm -hmm. One person was bringing their kids to see Peanut because they remembered Peanut being in their classroom uh, when they were a kid. uh Uh, So that was part of Peanut's ambassador job. He went to the classrooms. And then there's another person that was, um, their kids were in college, but they remember taking them to Powder Valley all the time and remember seeing Peanut or hearing about Peanut and they had to come say happy birthday. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. So tell us a little bit about Peanut's personality. You know, does she have quirky habits or reactions? And does she have any favorites maybe among the MDC staff? <laughs> I, I don't know about favorites among the MDC staff. She seems to really like our volunteers, which is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but she definitely has some personality to her. There are days when she's just, don't mess with me. I'm going to stay in my corner over here and you stay over there, mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty hard when you're trying to feed her. But right, when it comes right. food time, she knows and she's really excited about it. Okay. I wanted to get a selfie with Peanut on Saturday, but she kept um, orienting her rear to me instead of showing me her face. So there's no picture with me, but our producer, Emily Woodbury, who went to get um reactions from people who were there. She was much more successful than I was. Matthew, in your work as a naturalist, how often do you see animals who are affected by pollution? Um, It's, as sad as it sounds, it's pretty often. Um, So in my work as a naturalist, I do a lot of guided hikes out at different conservation areas all around St. Louis. Um, And something that I see quite often is rustling or trash and you're like what was that and you turn your head and it's like a squirrel investigating a bag of old bag of chips oh, or okay. birds trying to fly away with you know some trash to put put it in their nest mm-hmm. uh, so like these are things that we see all the time and yeah. it's it, it is pretty sad and it does it does bring hope though though that there's that many people there to help spread that cause mm-hmm. what is it that you wish people in our region especially as someone you know who grew up in kirkwood in this area the people would better understand about how their trash affects the environment and other species. Yeah, I, I think it's a really important thing to realize that Peanut's story is to remind us that wildlife is resilient, um, mm-hmm. but it's, you know, we shouldn't step away from that. We should really step into that challenge because we have to help those animals. Um, 
And I think becoming the good stewards of our environment is so that we can rescue turtles before things like this happen. Mm -hmm. We can be the, you know, find the solution before the problem even happens. And so that way we don't end up with more critters like Peanut Mm -hmm. because that's the success story in itself. Right. We heard Nick talking about uh, the next generation giving him hope. Do you share that hope? Do kids give you a sense of optimism about how we can interact better with the natural environment? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the amount of kids that we see on a daily basis, it's it's really high. And so we see a high quantity of kids. And the amount of kids that do walk up and they say, I found this piece of trash on the trail. And mm-hmm. they had in their pocket the whole time. Yeah. Or the amount of kids that, you know, parents try to throw some away and they go, that's plastic. It can be recycled, mom. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so uh, the that kind of stuff, it really does give me hope because it means that it's just not, you know, one person's fight. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's everyone gathering together to spread that cause. Yeah. And even at the um, at the party, the one of the gummy worms that I got to eat, uh, you'd pointed out that it's made out of a, a biodegradable plastic. So you all are doing your part as well. And the final question here, I mean, 40 years for peanut, that's quite a long time. How long do red-eared slider turtles typically live in captivity? And how many more birth rate, birthdays can we count on for peanut? Yeah, so that's that's kind of a tough question. So I found a lot of reports of red-eared sliders living um, and the pet trade, you know, all through probably about 50 years old. And that seems to be a pretty common number when people say they have an old turtle. Right now, you know, Peanut's 40. She's already, you know, outlived the the rate for wild turtles, which is about 30 years. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're just going to keep going and just hope for the best for the till the end of it. Yeah. Matthew Cavanaugh is a naturalist with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. I had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. We need to take a quick break, but we'll be back shortly to talk about other animal stories and how they can move people to think differently about their relationship with the natural world and act differently in it, too. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. Welcome back. I'm Eileen Cha. On today's show, we're talking about animals and animal stories that promote change in the way people think about the way human behavior and decisions affect the natural environment. Before the break, we discussed one specific animal story, that of Peanut the Turtle, a Missouri red-eared slider whose shell grew around a discarded plastic six-pack ring and became one of the best-known ambassadors for litter awareness. Peanut's not the only animal whose life has had change-making power. Our next two guests spend a great deal of time thinking about such stories and building out strategies to get people to change mindsets and habits. First, we have Tierra Curry, who's a senior scientist at the Center for Biological Diversity. Tierra, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for doing this show. We also have David Mizajewski, who is a naturalist with the National Wildlife Federation. David, welcome to you as well. Thanks for having me, Elaine. So good to talk with both of you, and and thank you for joining us today. So let's start with Peanut the Turtle, which is where we began with the show. Tiara, when is it that you first learned about Peanut the Turtle? So I'm one of those 80s kids that you were talking about earlier. I remember when it happened, and I remember just thinking that everything that we do as humans affects wildlife around us. And it was like a turning point for me about stuff, really, that everything comes from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And when you first heard this, were you talking with anyone about it, Tiara? 
I don't remember that much, but I remember just becoming so much more aware of environmental issues as a kid because of Peanut Story. Mm -hmm. So how effective has Peanut Story been in getting the word out about cutting plastic rings specifically and preventing littering? David? I think Peanut Story is the exact kind of story that in conservation can be really effective at doing everything you just said, raising awareness about the impacts that we human beings are having on our fellow species and, you know, impacting wildlife and their ability to survive. And the real key to it all is that, you know, we know Peanut as Peanut. She's not just, oh, that turtle. Um, And and that, I think, is the power in Peanut's story as an ambassador animal, um, is that because we, we talk about her as an individual, human beings, we relate to other individuals. And that is really what I think has has made Peanut and other ambassador animals like her so powerful for conservation. Mm -hmm. And is having a name part of that, David? I I, I think so. I mean, there's something that we call anthropomorphism, which is the idea of, you know, human beings kind of applying, you know, human traits and characteristics and importantly, motivations to other species. And, you know, in science, it's something that we guard against because it can be it can be really negative. You know, think about how um, historically we've treated predators. You know, predators killed, predators are dangerous. Therefore, they're bad. Let's eradicate them, right? But more and more, what we're finding in conservation in particular is that, you know, human beings, we we know from the social sciences, right? Um, You know, we relate to other people. We relate to to other human beings. And, you know, I think the right dose of anthropomorphism can be really, really powerful as we try to get conservation messages out there. And if we can help the public out there kind of relate to some of the challenges that wildlife are facing by, you know, kind of spotlighting an individual and giving it a name, I think that that's a, that's a win-win. Mm-hmm. And Tira, have you also observed the same thing uh, insofar as naming and maybe some of the conventional resistance there is among scientists to anthropomorphize? Yeah, so one of the things that the Center for Biological Diversity does is we try to protect jaguar habitat in Arizona. And a lot of people don't even realize that there are jaguars in Arizona. And one of the ways we raise that awareness is by working with elementary schools to give each of the individuals a name so Mm -hmm. that they're not just the jaguar like David was just talking about, but they're El Jefe or... Um, and so by letting the community name them, they feel ownership and then familiarity with them. And I think scientists, I mean, we share the planet with 8 million other species. We're just one species, and we all see it differently. Like what I see in my backyard is totally different than what a dragonfly sees. And mm-hmm. so it just makes sense that we're not going to understand everything but we need to work to protect everything. Right. Now, in the the segment that we had earlier in our conversation with uh, Matthew Kavanaugh, he had mentioned uh, kids, and we heard from other people about children. And, and Tara, what you've just mentioned about children in Arizona, I mean, do you see something interesting about the kind of relationship that did they develop when there is a more sort of personalized um, aspect to talking about endangered animals? Oh, for sure. And even just getting to spend time with animals or spending time in nature is so important for the well-being, not just of kids, but of adults. And so scientists are like trying to study and quantify that, but all the studies point to the same thing, which is that spending time observing wildlife, spending time in nature makes us feel better and and helps us out health-wise. Mm-hmm. Now, David, there is an example of an animal that has been named uh, with letters, and one of those examples is P-22. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. Just like the example that Tiara shared um, with the the jaguars, um, this is something that the National Wildlife Federation um, has done in California where we've given a name to an individual, in this case, a mountain lion. So it's another, another big cat. Mm-hmm. Um, P-22 is, is his name or was his name. He's, he's passed uh, last year. But, um, and that is the way that scientists number individual animals, again, to guard against kind of anthropomorphizing and, and having that affect their scientific research. And so 
the, the mountain lion's scientific name is Puma Concolor. So P is, is, you know, stands for Puma, and 22 is his number mm-hmm. in the population. And so the, 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 the backstory here is that the mountain lions of the Santa Monica Mountain ecosystem in California are in real trouble. Their uh, habitat is, is diminishing. They're having to cross all of the crazy busy freeways in Southern California. This is outside of L.A. Yes. And P-22 was an individual animal that actually did that, and he made his way into Griffith Park, which is the big, you know, urban park within Los Angeles, and he managed to survive there for over a decade. And but he was isolated, and he was at risk from, you know, uh, urban problems like rat poison and, and getting hit by cars. And so ultimately, what my colleague Beth Pratt, who is our California director, did was launch a whole campaign centered around P22. Again, we didn't give him a human name, but she made P22 the equivalent of, of, of John, you know, and because of that and her, her work up and down California, we were able to raise over $100 million to build what's going to be the biggest highway overpass for wildlife in the U.S. Um, mm-hmm. It's actually under construction right now. And so it can be powerful. If we just said the mountain lions, right, it wouldn't have been as effective as focusing on an individual and telling his story, you know, and again, I, I mentioned the dollar figure because that's what a you know for conservation we need we need fundraising we need people to get involved in support and I don't think it would have happened if we just kept P twenty two generic right right we also want to invite you to this conversation was there an animal or story that inspired you or changed your perspective that changed your behavior tell us about it give us a call at 314-382-8255 that's 382 talk or you can send an email to us at talk at stlpr.org we need to take a very quick break but we'll be back shortly to continue this conversation this is st louis on the air on st louis public radio If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. Welcome back. We're talking today about the legacy of Peanut, a turtle found near St. Louis more than 30 years ago with a shell deformed by a discarded plastic six-pack ring. Now 40 years old, Peanut is one of the best-known animal ambassadors for litter awareness. And we're speaking with David Mizajewski with the National Wildlife Federation and Tiara Curry with the Center for Biological Diversity about the power of other animal stories in changing the way people think about human impacts on nature and making choices that don't harm creatures in the environment. So we've talked about some of the the specific stories uh, linked to particular animals in uh, different places. But what is it that we know about what leads people to action and to measurable behavior change? Tiara? I think it's really important for people to have those individual experiences with wildlife. And like I think of monarch butterflies, a lot of people have them in their yard. They've seen the metamorphose. They've seen the caterpillars. And so that makes people just love monarchs and love that species in a way that a lot of other species or even other butterflies don't get the same appreciation. Mm -hmm. We have a a special relationship with monarch butterflies here in St. Louis. There's been quite a bit of research around that. What is it, David, that you have come to see about action in people and behavior change? Again, I'll echo Tiara's um, comments about the importance of having some kind of personal relationship with these these wild animals and these species that we're all working to protect. And I don't necessarily mean, you know, in a, in a physical way that you actually go and handle a, a wild animal. We, we, of course, don't want people to do that. But this whole idea of making it personal is something that is effective. We know that, you know, in, in, in science and conservation, we, you know, we rely on stats and data and science, and that's important. But 
we can't just keep spouting a bunch of numbers at people. That doesn't get people to care. And the monarch is actually a brilliant example. Um, this is another one of the National Wildlife Federation's core programs. We call it Garden for Wildlife. And we've been doing this for over 50 years. And the whole idea is to help people create a, you know, sort of a wildlife garden that will support animals like the monarch butterfly, like our native bees, all sorts of songbirds, et cetera, because not only do those species need our help, but we also know that when people look out their own door and they can take an action that is something that almost anybody can do, you know, you plant some wildflowers, plant a milkweed for the caterpillars, and then suddenly those animals show up. Well, let me tell you, uh, that makes a huge impact on people. They create that emotional relationship with those species, and then they care and they want to get more involved. Mm-hmm. And in the case of monarchs, Tierra, uh, we talked about specific behavior changes. What are some of those? So in addition to creating habitat, like David was just talking about, One of the primary threats to monarchs right now is loss of their forests in Mexico. And one of the primary reasons their forests are being cut down is to grow avocados to send to the United States because Mm. we eat so many avocados now. And so it's like avocados on their own aren't bad, but the, the area where they're grown is the area where monarchs migrate to spend the winter. So one of the ways that we can help them right now is by not eating avocados until the industry gets cleaned up so that they're not illegally cutting down the monarch's forest. And as far as the, you know, the, the choices that we can make as individuals versus sort of larger scale choices, I mean, what is it that we have control over, David? This is a really important thing for folks to keep in mind, and that is that, you know, individual change you know, or individual actions are really, really important, right? Um, they, they're an opportunity for all of us, again, to sort of get engaged and make a difference. You know, is one monarch butterfly garden in some, one person's backyard going to save the species? No. But if a thousand people do it, it does actually add up. But all of that is, ne- is never to say that we still don't need bigger scale change. We need good, strong wildlife policy and legislation and regulation if we're going to fix these big picture problems. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a mix of things, right? You know, people need something that they can do on the small scale, on the personal level. And as long as that leads into a bigger awareness and, you know, support for bigger initiatives, that's how I think we're going to solve a lot of our conservation problems. Mm -hmm. And Tara, to the point that you were making about avocados, I mean, how many people would need to abstain from purchasing avocados at the supermarket for you know actual change to occur? Well, every action that we make, every dollar that we spend is either a vote for or against something, right? And so if we could make enough of a blip to get the industry's attention, there's already, um, avocados are already inspected for pests. So we know where every single avocado is from, Mm. but the government isn't regulating the importing agencies to make sure they're not from illegally deforested areas. And they could. Mm -hmm. The the inspection process is already in place. So people can contact the USDA and also vote with their dollars so that there isn't such a demand for avocados. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the folks our producer, Emily Woodbury, spoke with at Peanut's 40th birthday party was Jen Hankhouse of St. Louis, and she had this to say about corporate responsibility and accountability. I guess if, as a whole, if we are supposed to do better personally in our in our families and teach our kids, the companies could do better. Like some of the, I was explaining to Logan this morning that some of the six-pack rings are going out, and a lot of like beer companies are going the click on ones that you can use for even sodas but those are all recyclable it's solid so nothing can swim through and be caught a lot of places are moving to you know paper straws biodegradable straws things like that so people are going to do the rings they can the companies can do better and make better ones for the environment and we want to hear from you was there an animal or a story 
that inspired you to change your perspective or changed your behavior about the way that you interact with the natural environment. We want to hear about it. Give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can send us an email at talk at stlpr.org. Now, David, hearing Jen Hankhouse there, what is it that came to mind for you as you were listening to what she had to share? Honestly, it was one word. Amen. <laughs> uh, was, you know, she said more articulately than I than I did. What uh, the point is is that personal actions are important, but the onus is not on us as individuals to fix these problems. Most of the big picture problems that our planet is facing, you know, are because of large scale, you know, corporate actions and government level, you know, sort of accountability and actions. And that's where we need to. You know, that's where we're going to see the biggest impacts. Again, that's not to say that our personal actions aren't important um, and, and can't make change and be part of that. But, you know, a lot of times you hear sort of the, the, the onus of saving the planet put on individuals when they're by some of these big corporations and government entities who are the really the only ones that have the power and the pocketbooks to actually make the change happen. Mm-hmm. And thus far, I mean, we've been talking about what affects individual people's behavior, when it comes to big companies, are they persuaded by animal stories, uh, Tiara? <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one. I mean, individuals can put pressure on those companies, but individuals can also get involved in setting that policy. Like right now there's a species called the hellbender, which they are at the St. Louis Zoo. They yes. breed them there. Uh-huh. There's just it's like this beautiful and grotesque salamander. They're they're chunks. They're like five pounds, and they are endangered, but they're not officially protected. And so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service right now is reviewing whether to put them on the endangered species list, which would help protect their habitat and give more funding for captive breeding programs. So people can write the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and say, hey, please protect the hellbender. It's this really cool salamander that I might not ever get to see outside the zoo, but I hope to someday. Mm-hmm. Now, David, you've spent quite a lot of time uh, out in media, places like um, the the Conan O'Brien show. I was watching some of the, the past uh, segments that you've done there. How much does that kind of media push um, help people to understand a little bit more about ways that they can connect with with animals in particular and then not do things that harm the environment they live in? Yeah, I mean, Matthew said it earlier um, when he was talking about peanut and the power of ambassador animals. And so what you're referencing is um, over the years, I've done many, many uh, both in person, live, you know, event type shows, um, but also media, um, TV shows like Conan O'Brien and uh, the Today Show and others, where uh, I bring on animal ambassadors, and that's the entire goal: is to like let people see, you know, the real animals and talk about them as individuals. And you know, I'm under no illusion that somebody watching a late night show is going to suddenly, you know, save save a species. But it's one piece of a bigger picture effort to communicate and to begin to have, you know, sort of these, these emotional bonds forged between viewers or people in an audience or people reading something. Um, most recently, I'm hosting a series on the platform Wondrium, and it's called Field Guide to North American Wildlife. And, and Tiara was just talking about hellbenders. That's one of the species that I focus on. And I really advocated to not just sort of share scientific facts about each of these individual animals or species. I, in each episode, I do a storytelling segment where I do name an animal and I tell a day in the life. And again, my goal is to get people to care about hellbenders um, or whatever animal I'm featuring in my media appearances so that they will take those actions and, and it'll, you know, something will stick in their brain a little bit more than just hard scientific facts. Mm-hmm. We have Roe, who is calling in from Dogtown. Roe, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Hi, thanks so much for taking my call. Sure. Um, I wanted to share a story about uh, my dog, Mr. Shivers, um, because my uh, now wife, then girlfriend, found a puppy when we were driving in San Felipe, Mexico, about five years ago. And she yelled at me to stop the car. He, like, ran in front of the car. And she picked him up and... uh, 
basically saved his life. He had mange and worms and ticks and, and everything horrible going for him. He was maybe two or three months old. And while I was totally opposed to having a dog in our relationship at that time in our life, it was also the moment I knew I was going to marry her. Oh. Uh, <laughs> because I would never pick up a dog off the street, but I would really like to spend my life with somebody who would. Oh, that's very sweet. <laughs> He's become the most incredible puppy. To her chagrin, I'm now his best friend, mm -hmm. even though I didn't want him. Um, and, yeah, we love pets, and they mean the world to us. Mm -hmm. And they absolutely change the way we interact, not just with other dogs, but I've seen my wife even soften up to, like, other insects in the house mm -hmm. that she doesn't want to uh, harm, but rather rehouse gently into the backyard. So it sounds like so, you have a... Quite a gem of a, a partner, Rowie. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about that. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for calling in about uh, Mr. Shivers and the role of your pet in your life. You can also share your story the way that Rowie did by giving us a call about an animal who has inspired you. Give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 314-382-TALK. David, what is the role that pets play in connecting people with other species? And how often does that translate to wildlife? Yeah, I love that story because it really does illustrate how, how pets play into all of this. Now, you know, pets are not wildlife. They're domesticated species, or they should be. And, um, and so they, I think, are such a brilliant illustration of the fact that animals are individuals. And it's sometimes hard for us to think of, of wildlife in that way. But, you know, at least, you know, for, 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 for mammals and birds and, and, and species that are, you know, sort of similar to us, um, you know, maybe more similar to us uh, than an insect maybe. But at any rate, it helps us really see when we have pets that animals are individuals. And if we can see animals as individuals, I think it, it is, a, again, a really powerful way of helping inspire people to want to get involved protecting it. It's easy to ignore when it's just sort of an amorphous, faceless mass out there. But when you think of it like, you know, this particular animal, um, and, and, and you know that that animal is an individual because you have dogs and cats and, you know, pets that you see on a daily basis and, and know without any question whatsoever that these are individual with, individuals with personalities and, and emotions. Um, I think, again, it's, it's a really powerful piece of the conservation puzzle. Mm -hmm. And in the context of how we started this hour, which was a conversation about the legacy of Peanut, Peanut is a red-eared slider, which was used to be among the most popular turtles kept as pets. And in, in turtle situation, she was found near St. Louis more than 30 years ago. And her shell was deformed after she got stuck in a discarded plastic six-pack ring uh, in her youth. And three decades ago, plastic was a big problem. And it's even more so today. The reality is that most plastic is not recycled, and it is all around us. And the amount of single-use plastic in an individual's day, on a day-to-day -day basis, is quite staggering. Tiara, what is it that you wish people better understood about how their trash, a plastic or otherwise, affects the environment and other species. Plastic isn't just around us, it's inside of us now. Plastic is detectable in human blood because it has broken down in the environment so much that now we're eating it because um, it's in the ocean and I've taken into the food web and it even distills out as little particles from the environment. So they say diamonds are forever, but plastic is really forever. And we lived without it for so long, and now we're so dependent on it that that's one of the things that individuals can do, but also a big policy thing to try to get – I mean, plastic is basically fossil fuel, right? And fossil mm -hmm. fuel is destroying the planet. So um, moving away from plastic and getting policies so that less plastic is produced and so that it's not just an individual's job to recycle it, because mm -hmm. it's, it's really a false solution. Right. David, what about the work that you do and this plastic waste problem? How often does that come up in your, in your work, be it 
in media or just sort of on a, a day-to-day basis behind the scenes? Yeah, I mean, not every individual or every wildlife species is, you know, do you see a direct impact visually like you did with peanut in terms of plastic pollution? But as Tierra said, it literally is something that's affecting species globally because it is so ubiquitous. And again, we now have the microplastics that have broken down and are in those food webs. So, you know, whether it's albatrosses who are endangered, who are dying because they are feeding their babies plastic waste that's floating in the ocean. Um, or again, it's, a, it's an example of like peanut where it's, you know, a physical trash wrapped around their body. Um, it, it manifests in so many different ways. I'm also thinking of sea turtles, you know, feeding on plastic floating in the ocean that looks like jellyfish, which a lot of sea turtle species eat. So it is, it is a big issue. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, again, sort of insidiously ubiquitous, especially, again, when you make the connection with fossil fuels. So it is, it's, a, it's, it's a big issue. Right. We have Tracy, who is calling from St. Charles. Tracy, welcome to St. Louis on the Air, and tell us, what has today's conversation brought up for you? Thank you so much for having me. Um, immediately, I was thinking about my son. My youngest son has autism, and he about four years ago, started taking riding lessons from a neighbor with a a horse, an old horse named Hoppy. And he has core muscle issues and has for a long time and been in occupational therapy. And within a year of working with Hoppy, his core muscle uh, strength improved so much we had no more issues. Um, His love for and devotion to Hoppy has caused him to use language we never thought he would use because mm-hmm. he's so motivated to be understood by his horse. Um, and just the love and affection and friendship between my son and this horse has just like changed all of our lives. Wow. We love him. Thank you for calling and, and sharing that story. So stories like this are quite encouraging, but it, I, I can imagine that for each of you, uh, Tiara and David, that, Sometimes it can feel like it's just too big a job. How is it that you, how do you deal with feelings of resignation sometimes about making substantive change? Tiara? So I lead our extinction crisis campaign at the Center for Biological Diversity. So I think about extinction all day, every day which sounds really depressing, but the the joyful part of it for me is getting to connect with other people who care and who make a difference. And there are so many people out there who are doing everything they can to turn the situation around and to end the extinction crisis. And we don't always hear about those stories, but from scientists who scale cliffs to get the last two plants or who raise baby freshwater mussels and put them back in the river there are millions of people who are trying to help. And those are the stories we don't hear, but we are part of something bigger. Everybody who cares is part of a bigger mo- a bigger movement. Mm-hmm. And David, for you, uh, maybe is there a story in particular that you find yourself turning to when when you feel a little discouraged? Yeah, there is. And it actually just happened to me this week. Um, and I'll take us back to the monarch butterfly. Um, for me, you know, well, and I, I guess big picture, I'll say that compassion fatigue is a real issue. And if you work in wildlife conservation or, you know, conservation in general, it, you know, the, the problems are big and a lot of the news is not good. You know, we're not going to save every single species that needs it. And it is very easy to become frustrated and demotivated. But what I always go back to, um, you know, for that hope is, is the small thing. And so, I just, over the course of this, this week, I have been watching female monarch butterflies lay eggs on the milkweed that I specifically planted in my garden for that purpose. Milkweed mm-hmm. the only plant that caterpillar, monarch caterpillars can eat. So that little personal thing is something that fuels me and helps me, you know, have the hope to keep fighting the big picture fight and take on some of these issues that seem insurmountable, but there is hope. And even if we need to get that motivation from a small thing, I think it's worth it because uh, even if it is discouraging, it doesn't mean that it's not worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. 
David Mizajewski is naturalist with the National Wildlife Federation, and Tiara Curry is a senior scientist at the Center for Biological Diversity. Tiara and David, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you so much. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Doerr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis.